My name is Philippine Kiruna, but I prefer to go by Pin, which is a short version of Philippine. That's how informal I am, and it's really informal. <laughs> so um, I come from a part of Kenya called West Pokot County. It's in the northwestern region of Kenya, up towards the north, and um, it's a very dry area, very, very, very marginalized, and um, not really heard about a lot in the mainstream, um, you know, life in Kenya. Um, another thing about that part of the world is that we are so far away from the central um, area of Kenya, that is Nairobi and Nakuru. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Kenya, all the cities there. Nobody? Oh, you are? Okay. Um, so a lot of like business, new things, innovation, and opportunities, including education, happen in uh, big cities like Nairobi and Nakuru. For somebody like me who comes from so far away, it's about eight hours drive away from the city. Um, it's not like here in the US where you, your, your culture so much promotes traveling and you know getting to know your country. Um, our culture is not really like that. One of the reasons is because it's not affordable, right? And so for somebody like me who comes from that far place that is so secluded from you know, where all the wonderful things are happening, going to Nairobi is a very, you know, great opportunity that we always look forward to. And um, it's also an opportunity also for career advancement. And so, um, as I was growing up, I noticed how um, a lot of people my age and uh, in my neighborhood um, were always anticipating to go into Nairobi and into Nakuru and have these opportunities and you know, being the in, you know, of um, what a developed life is supposed to look like. They wanted to be in that, but uh, I also wanted it for a long time. <laughs> and I also wanted to kind of like, you know, go where life is faster and, you know, um, where when you go and you come back, everybody gives you a high status, you know, they give you a lot of esteem and respect. I wanted that for a while, but then when I, stepped out to go out and do my undergraduate. I studied in the city. I, I noticed that I started just thinking like, um, you know, economically about how systems work, even at that level. And I realized that a lot of our resources were being taken out of the community. A lot was being invested into people like me and my sisters and um, people my age. But we were not thinking about bringing it back. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to start Digital Keze. I saw it as an opportunity of me giving back to my community, as well as a way for me to give my community an opportunity to, to come out of being marginalized <coughs> and be a, at an equal competitive uh, status with the rest of Kenya and you know the rest of the world. And so that's one side of it. The other side of it is um, the fact that I'm a woman um, I was brought up in a, in a family that's all girls and in a community that is really, um, 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 they favor boys, they favor men more, you know, and to be married and to have, to be married is one of the ways of earning status, earning protection and earning access to economics, econ economic empowerment, like a job, a credit and all that kind of stuff. And also being married gets you into a family that will also provide you all this wealth around you. And so I, I started noticing those, uh, that kind of marginalization really early because of, of my family and my mom. My mom was very like forward thinking and very strong. And she also had sort of like gone through her own challenges from her family and she saw that this is really uh, the way they the position they gave women wasn't really what she wanted. She wanted a higher position and she wanted to be respected and to earn her own rather than get it through a man. And so um, one of the things she did, she refused to be married early in, in exchange for education. So when she chose education, they kind of um, ostracized her, but she was strong for that. And so naturally her children all girls, she was very protective and she was very um, uh, motivated, she motivated us a lot 
to find our identity apart from a man and uh, what they can do for us. And so that also influenced me to, when I went outside, it was so natural for me to notice like the status of women too outside and the kind of opportunities they get. And so for me, um, starting this organization now became an avenue for um, bringing equality for my community as well as equality for the women uh, within the community uh, as compared to men. And so, um, um, yeah, so I came, I ended up going to university and in the spirit of adventure and, you know, finding myself, I ended up moving out of the country and working in a different country, you know, and just learning skills and learning leadership and, you know, expressing my faith and growing in my faith. So this journey took me to Rwanda and after that I came back into Kenya and all this time I was just forming and thinking to myself how I can acquire skills that would actually make me a practical leader to address some of the issues I was seeing in my community. And so this journey brought me to Eastern and I came and did an international development here. And while I was here is when I kind of like brought all that I was thinking about into paper and into a lot of reflection, like um, finding, you know, doing theological reflection as well as ideological reflection to see like how really, what I value and how that plays out in um, actions and goals and objectives for an organization. And so, so while I was here is when um, we actually, my friends and I, two of my Eastern friends, we bought the organization Jitokeze or Mama of Africa. And we decided because my community is really, like, like I told you, it's very dry, so drought is a big issue. And drought causes people to conflict over resources and so I kind of saw, even going through Eastern, one of the courses I did was a sustainable development. And one of the good things about that course is it helps you to see a community in its holistic sense, you know, not just economics. You see the environment, you see the social, you see the uh, equity issues, you see the religion issues and stuff. And so um, when we back Jito Keze, we decided it needs to be a community that, I mean, an organization that addresses the community's needs in a sense that it should bring holistic development. And, and so that's how we ended up. To, so we, we have decided we are going to work with uh, promoting food production, income generation, and uh, peace building with women and for women, but with the purpose of touching all the other angles of, um, of our society. So, so that's my story in a, <laughs> in a nutshell, a big nutshell. How did you choose to focus on women? Because of my own experience as a woman, and understanding the needs of women, and understanding, you know, just connecting with women. And like I told you, maybe I, I would like to just go a little bit back to my mom's story, because I think my, it's hard to tell my story without telling my mom's story. My mom, when she was about 12 years, I think she must have been between 12 and 13, she was going to a Catholic school, and um, at that age in her community, she, she was brought up in a community called the Sabaut. It's a very like a tribal, tribal community. Um, that community, they favor boys so much, and um, the way they don't see the need for educating a girl, right? But they see a need for educating boys. So my mom was always competing with the brothers to uh, have her father see that this is a valuable thing for, for me to be taken through school. But my, da my grandfather didn't see that. My grandfather always, he would tell them, go and work in the, in the land and help your mom and you know, that kind of thing. So my mom, she ended up learning about a Catholic nun school that was giving free education. So she went to, to study there and she became a Catholic and you know, she got educated. And in that experience, uh, being in relationship with these nuns who were also, they were foreigners, they were from France. One of them was called Philippine and the other one was called Stephanie. Um, they had, they were kind of like empowering girls and helping girls to understand what uh, female genital mutilation, a common practice in the area, would do to them, you know? And so my mom at 13, she was supposed to go through that practice. And what happens is you're, you're mutilated and uh, through that process, you're also kind of like educated in 
uh, what a woman is, you know, what uh, culturally what your responsibilities are and how you should behave and all that. And then you, you're taken through the cut and then you become a woman and then you're given a husband, right? So my mom's, the nuns told her about the FGM, the female genital mutilation, and she said she didn't want to do it. So she went back home when it was her turn and she said she didn't want to do it and she didn't want to get married to this man that they had chosen for her. Then her brothers and, <laughs> and my grandpa, grandpa, they told her, you come back home when you've decided you want to be a woman. That's what they told her. So my mom never, never came back home for a long time. She stayed with the nuns in the convent, went through high school, went through like what would be an equivalent of associate degree here. The nuns took her through all that and she ended up starting her own business, you know, marrying a man who she loved <coughs> and she brought us up. And so that is a common story in my family. In very many, like she constantly tells that, but she also, she says it many times to kind of like, um, Tell, her, tell us that we don't have to submit to what we feel is oppressive to us. But in many ways, I've also seen it play out in her life in the sense where she struggles to forgive her father and her brothers, and she struggles in this spirit of feeling competitive towards them and showing them that, you know, you tried to put me down, but look at me, I'm, I'm going to do better than all of you. So I see it even in that way. So it affected my life. and. That has been a positive, um, it has been kind of like a positive energy for us because my mom also, she worked so hard and sacrificed a lot to make sure we all got good quality and high level education. But I've, I also have looked at it from another angle as a Christian where, um, you know, for unforgiveness and, um, you know, just sense of oppression can also kind of like rob wholeness from her life and from our family's life. So that's that's like a, a personal side to it, like that I look at it from. But all in all, it's the reason why I decided to form Jitokeze. And so one of the things we will do in Jitokeze is we're gonna, um, for every woman who works with us, we're gonna give them an opportunity to take training in conflict transformation. And the purpose for that is that they would be able to also see um, their role in building peace and to also deal with the trauma they experience because no matter what you go, no matter like how conscious you are in many ways, uh, discrimination and uh, marginalization actually traumatizes a person, you know? And uh, it traumatizes and it also causes, especially in my context, it causes women to have a sense of uh, like internalized oppression within themselves and towards other women where they, they get, rather than working together, they compete with each other, you know, to have, to get to the standards that they're denied by men. That's one side of it. The other side of it is that they take the identity of second grade person, you know, second grade citizen and whatever. They take it as their own. And that to me is an effect of trauma. And to me that without that being dealt with, there is no true justice, you know, and uh, without true justice, how can a community be sustainable? It's always, uh, it's always going to give um, play a ground for conflict and, you know, for inequality. And so that's, um, those are some of the reasons why I decided uh, to work with women, just having the strong influence of my mom and knowing her history. My mom also, and other women I have known in my community have also given me this uh, value for the potential of a person, no matter what kind of marginalization or oppression you face. People only need to be believed in and to be invested in, you know? And um, I've, this has been a challenge for me as I've been working in international development because one of the values we have come to embrace is the need to, to work alongside and to work from the bottom up. In many ways, many organizations, they come and impose. They come and with the money, the power and money, they make decisions for our community. They don't really listen, but that actually is the same thing as what um, you know, gender discrimination is. It, it achieves the same effect in our community. And so, um, so having my, my mom break the chain of poverty in our family 
makes me believe and know that we can do it. You know, we don't need somebody else to come and do it for us. We can do it for ourselves. What we need is just partners to work alongside us. Yeah. So, so that's my story. <laughs> Well, can you talk a little bit about what Tudor Cater will do in Kenya? Okay. And then maybe also a little bit about how um, Americans can walk alongside. Okay. Well, to, I thought maybe I should bring like um, written stuff to help you see what they can do if you don't know if they do you know. This is just like a snapshot of the programs we will do. If you would just pass those along. to do our work by organizing women in groups, in self-help groups, because of the power that it has to establish women and, and kind of like pool their resources, help them to pool their resources, and then they can start something independent and run with it, because we, we have a vision of not always working in the community. And so we are, we, in this coming year, I'm going to be working with 94 women and 15 of them are actually girls. 79 is women and 15 are girls from my former high school. 64 of those women, we're gonna support them to organize into each group of 16 and give them um, training on how to save money together, you know, um, run credits among themselves, learn about budgeting and learn about mobilizing other non-financial resources that they need to engage in food production. And then we are also give them, gonna give them the training to, um, to learn about integrating indigenous crops with trees, uh, fruit trees and other types of trees that uh, 10 years down the line they would be able to get food from and which will also help to kind of change the weather patterns locally and attract rain. So that's 16 women. And uh, that group of women, we're also give, gonna give them a matching grant for whatever saving they have made We'll give them a matching grant so that they can buy irrigation equipment, water tanks to harvest roof, uh, I mean water from the roof. And we're also working with a local nonprofit organization that was also started by a woman. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're going to be working with them because they have expertise in constructing a sand dam. And so we are going to kind of like get half the money that's needed for the sand dam, and they're going to get half, and then they're gonna bring in skilled people to construct a sand dam on a dry riverbed to a with, in anticipation of rain whenever it falls, you know, harness that and then it can be used to get the land. So this is, these 64 women are gonna be in one area of my community, it's called Chepar area. And then um, 15, the 15 girls um, that um, are from my high school also are facing a situation that's very similar to what my mom went through. They are all at risk of criminal genital mutilation and being exposed to early marriage. And so this school is already running a program where it's allowing them to stay within the school over the holidays so that they can have an opportunity to go through school for the four years that they need to be in school. So the principal of the school, when she heard about what I was doing, she said I should come and work with her because they are having trouble over the holidays feeding them. And so I said, if you give me land, I'll give you the training and I'll give you, uh, you know, <laughs> um, you know, access to water harvesting equipment. And she accepted. So I'm gonna work with those girls, give them training, and also give them access to irrigation equipment and water harvesting equipment. 
So that's the bulk of our program. And hopefully, like in the long term, that is what we will mostly do. And then the other smaller component of our program is we are also organizing another group of 16 and a group of 15. The first group of 16, we're organizing them to start a business of breeding chickens to sell for eggs and for chicken meat. And then the other group, we are organizing them so that they can we can train them to kind of make school uniforms and bags to sell locally to local schools. And so that's the, the smaller parts of our program. And, and so yeah, so that snapshot would show you um, what it's all about. And actually it's nice I have this opportunity to talk to you guys because I really want to start a chapter here in Eastern that would be part of this program. And I just want to tell you a little bit about how I'm connecting with the U.S. Like I told you, I have, I have a value for bottom-up kind of development. And, uh, and because of this, I'm working with organizations that are coming along as partners, you know. So that those who would be willing to support what the program we already have and work along with us and be willing to learn with us through the process. And so the way I have worked with my church is to organize people who are you know, passionate about it and they are forming chapters within my church and other places that is um, currently raising money but they are also learning with us through this process about what climate change is and you know, how it's affecting communities within the US and how <coughs> really climate change and poverty link together is the biggest injustice I think is. So they're also learning about the justice aspect of climate change and sending word out within their churches and encouraging people to be more, you know, to be more sustainable in the way they live their life. And so the partnership I'm forming is for people who are not only willing to donate money, but are also willing to kind of like, you know, engage in group, uh, book discussions, you know, run films, you know, organize events to educate people about uh, climate change impacts on the poor and to educate people about the work we are doing. So I would really like to form a chapter here at Eastern that students can run. So if you guys are interested, let's talk after this. <laughs> I think I'm also going to have an opportunity to teach a perspectives class in February. So you guys are welcome to come to that. Uh, we still haven't posted uh, information about it, but um, be on the lookout for it. Can you talk a little bit about how climate change directly leads to poverty or affects poverty? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I think um, we all know we need resources to survive, right? And economic equality has a lot to do with um, um, access that you have to resources. Now, for people like women and girls and men in my community, our, our way of relating with resources is very direct. It's not so much like here where it's, in the US, um, the economy is so much driven by service, so you can get an income by working for someone, and you can also uh, get your food that's brought in from Mexico or wherever, you don't have to go work on the land to actually get your food. Now in my community, uh, income, you have to go work on the land, you know, to get income. You have to go work on the land to get your food. If you don't do that, there's no way you can um, you can rise out of poverty. And so climate change is a big problem for us because first of all, we are very prone to it because of our environmental conditions. We are very close to the equator. And so um, when, when climate changes, unlike here in the US where the, um, um, you know, the weather is very temperate, the places that are already hot, like my place, feel it very fast. You know, and the impact is so great. And so we fit, we are vulnerable because of that. And then we are also vulnerable because the resources that we directly depend on, like water, and you know, the way land works, is directly impacted by global warming. And so because of that, uh, and we are, if you come to my community, if any of you ever gets a chance to come, we, you notice that we live very simply. We don't have a lot of technology that you guys have here, and cars, and you know, all that stuff. And yet, climate change is not really, it's, a, it's really brought in by impacts of technology, you know? So in many ways, we are suffering the most. We have the least technological advances that we need to actually 
adapt to it. Like for example, constructing a sand dam is one of the good ways you can harness you can harness flood waters, right? Um, okay, let me just like um, go back a little bit. Uh, the way climate change is affecting us, it's making us get our rain very irregularly, 